Sandoval, but as seminar today, we have the great pleasure to have here uh, Seth Coren from the University of Chicago. Uh, he started his uh, bachelor study in the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia in astrophysics, and then he moved to the University of California in Santa Barbara, working with Nathaniel Craig, working on the hierarchy problem. Because of his uh, PhD thesis, he won the Sakurai Award from the APS this year, I guess it was uh, the beginning of this year. And uh, now he's, uh, we are very happy that he's here with us sharing his knowledge on the lithium problem. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Seth, please. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. My uh, close friend from graduate school, Gabriel, was himself an undergraduate here at UNAM in physics. So I've been hearing about UNAM for the past seven years, but this is my first time in Mexico City and really been enjoying it, all of the, the colors and the trees and the history. Uh, it, it's been a great time. Um, and I'm also glad to be here at the Institute talking to a broad audience, um, because one of the things I really enjoyed a lot about this work is just how interdisciplinary it is. So at its core, I'll be trying to address a cosmological problem with particle physics, but I will also connect to astrophysics and to nuclear physics and to field theory. So hopefully there's something for everyone. Um, as a result, I'm also going to try to be very introductory. And my goal is really just to motivate the approach that I've taken um, and try to paint a basic outline of the scenario I'm proposing. And uh, further details are in the paper I put out uh, on the archive a couple uh, months ago at this point. So let me begin by just briefly reviewing the early universe in case you don't think about it very often. We can see visually with photons back in time all the way to around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the epic of recombination. This is when the cosmic microwave background was released and the CMB has been just an enormous success of precision cosmology. We've learned so much physics from it. The setting of the lithium problem is the prior phase transition, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, when the few light elements are created in the early universe a few minutes after the hot Big Bang. And Big Bang nucleosynthesis is a really remarkable theory. For one, it intimately involves all four of our fundamental forces. The story of BBN very briefly is that the strong force wants to bind nucleons together into nuclei, and it has to fight against the gravitational expansion of the universe and the weak decays of neutrons and the electromagnetic repulsion of protons. So everything's involved. And furthermore, once you know the standard model and nuclear physics, registradas como... if, you, sorry, if you use uh, the data from the cosmic microwave background, then Big Bang nucleosynthesis is essentially a zero parameter theory. It's just a cross check on how well we understand all that physics of the four fundamental forces uh, that takes place many orders of magnitude before the cosmic microwave background where we really understand what's going on. So I think it's an important thing to understand. So how are we doing? I have uh, a couple plots from this great recent review um, that was put out after folding in the Planck data and uh, comparing the theoretical predictions for the primordial abundances in purple with the observed abundances in yellow. And you can see uh, for helium on the left, helium four with two protons, we do a great job, it matches. The one that should really impress you is deuterium on the right with one proton. Ah, thank you. Um, deuterium with one proton. And you can see, even though it's down at, the, at one part in 10 to the five, we get it absolutely bang on. And this is again, another great success of precision cosmology and nuclear physics. But there's one more observable of Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and that is the abundance of lithium with three protons. And unlike in the other cases, here we predict way more lithium than we have observed. And this enormous discrepancy is known as the lithium problem. Now, as I said, I'm going to be suggesting a particle physics beyond the standard model way to address 
this discrepancy. Um, but just because this uh, discrepancy is so large, um, I want to say a, a brief bit about how the measurement is done astrophysically, because you know this is such an enormous discrepancy that maybe you think, well, we really don't know what we're measuring. Um, and indeed, cosmology is hard. Um, because you know, theoretically, we predict what happened very early on, soon after the Big Bang, and uh, especially when we're looking for very small amounts of elements and things, we need to look in the modern day mostly at relatively nearby astrophysical environments. So you need some way to have confidence that you're really measuring some primordial abundance rather than lithium produced in stars or something like that. And indeed, um, this was first, or the, the solution to this was first realized by a husband and wife team, Spitz and Spitz in 1982. And they realized you could just take advantage of some basic stellar dynamics. Um, when we look at stars, we really only ever get light from the very atmosphere, the very outside of the star. Um, and for relatively cold stars, uh, whatever was initially in the atmosphere, these cold stars are fully convected. So what was initially in the atmosphere can be convected all the way down to the core, to the hottest part of the star and destroyed. So you think that whatever the initial abundance was, um, there will be less, you will see less of it in cooler stars because some of it has been destroyed. But eventually, when you get to hot enough stars, there develops an inner radiative zone, which is convectively stable. And so no longer is the entire star convective, but only an outer layer. And so above a certain temperature, you expect that the atmosphere, lithium in the atmosphere, isn't convected all the way down to the hottest part of the, of the star anymore, but only in some layer, so it doesn't get destroyed. And so Spitz and Spitz predicted that they would go and look at the abundance of lithium as a function of temperature. And for cooler stars, you would see less and less lithium as it could be destroyed in the core. But eventually for hot enough stars, you should see a plateau. You should see a flat abundance and that would be indicative of the primordial abundance. And so they went out and did this measurement. And of course, you know, like all initial astrophysical measurements, it's a ridiculously small sample size from a, a particle physicist perspective. But indeed, they argued that uh, for hotter temperatures, and this is astrophysics, so hotter is on the left, uh, for hotter temperatures, you see a plateau of abundance. And they argued that they see a drop off for cooler stars, uh, giving them confidence that they were really measuring the primordial abundance of lithium. And of course, this was in 1982, in the 40 years since, uh, there's been lots of great work by astronomers and astrophysics measuring lithium in all sorts of different environments. And we have much better data at this point. And so just one recent review from you know, one type of data on lithium, here you see you know, in much better uh, uh, significance, the plateau of the lithium abundances and a plateau which is way below the uh, value predicted by Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So um, indeed, uh, astronomers, astrophysicists, nuclear physicists, everyone, I, I absolutely agree, everyone should think further about and think very deeply about if there could be any very strange astrophysics going on. People have been thinking about that since 1982, but the situation uh, is at best unclear for an astrophysical resolution. So I think it's worth thinking about a possible new physics, uh, particle physics solution to this problem. So let me again remind you very briefly of the timeline. At very early times, at very high temperatures, you just have a quark gluon plasma. And when you go through the QCD phase transition, you end up with protons and neutrons. And again, Big Bang nucleosynthesis creates for you the first few light elements, and we end up with too much lithium. Now, I'm not the first person to think about particle physics solutions to this problem, but in my opinion, all of the prior ideas uh, tend to struggle 
because they don't do anything that uniquely picks out lithium. They try to modify the things going on at Big Bang nuclear synthesis, but unavoidably that sort of modifies everything a bit. And especially in light of how well we've predicted and observed the abundance of deuterium, it's just not allowed to do some sort of major shifts anymore. So I set out last year to think about if there could be anything that would only affect lithium. And I entirely agree for a particle theorist, this is a really weird idea. Um, and that's why nobody had, had tried to do it or tried to look for this for some decades. But what I'm going to tell you, my plan is that I'm going to have some new dynamical objects in the early universe, cosmic strings, and I'll, I'll get to what that is later. Um, and I claim that these cosmic strings are going to only destroy lithium. There's gonna be a symmetry argument for why they only destroy lithium and not any of these other elements. And I agree, um, it is surprising. I was very surprised that such a theory exists and in fact, exists very close to the standard model. Um, but I, I think it's really fascinating. And just to give you a, a taste so you don't think I'm completely crazy uh, off the bat, um, in fact, lithium is going to be chosen because lithium has three protons and the standard model has three generations. And, and that's going to be the thing that picks out lithium. Um, but I'll get there. Uh, and so indeed, this theory is surprising. Um, it's surprising that it exists so close to the standard model. And it really is heavily uh, inspired by thinking deeply about the structure of the standard model. So I'm going to start by reviewing the standard model for you. So for matter fields in the standard model, we have quarks and leptons. There are two different types of quarks, up and down type. And in leptons, we have the electron and the neutrino. And the standard model is specified by the gauge symmetries that act on these particles, uh, which are equivalently the forces that act on them. Um, the most familiar is probably electromagnetism because we have a massless photon at low energies. And electromagnetism talks to both types of quarks and to electrons but not to neutrinos. This is why it took so long to find them. Then we also have uh, an SU2 gauge symmetry, the weak force, which talks to all of the particles. It's uh, associated with the W and Z bosons, but the weak force is so weak because it is broken by the Higgs boson, which gives mass to the W and Z bosons and means that the weak force is only a very short range force. And then finally, we have quantum chromodynamics, the strong force, which is carried by the gluons and talks only to the different types of quarks. And this has another type of very interesting low energy behavior that it confines. And so at low energy, we don't see bare quarks or gluons. We see composite states that are not charged under QCD, such as the familiar proton and neutron with um, one or two up and down quarks. And this is the basic structure of the standard model. Now there's an important question for particle physics, which is whether the proton is stable. It's important for lots of reasons. You know, For one, it determines in some sense whether matter will exist in the universe indefinitely into the future. And this was especially realized to be an important question in the 1980s when we discovered these simple grand unified theories. And we found that in these grand unified theories, the proton is always unstable. It decays, for example, for, um, a proton into a positron and say a photon or something. And you can see that manifestly conserves charge. And this was great news in the 1980s because it meant we could build these enormous, fantastic detectors and look for proton decay and try to uh, have experimental access to that heavy grand unified physics. But we built these detectors and we've been very surprised over the last 40 years to not have observed proton decay. In fact, all we've gotten are better and better limits on the lifetime of the proton. So with that in mind, I think it's important to remember that in the standard model itself, the proton is actually exactly stable. 
And it has to do with a, a so-called accidental symmetry um, that I, I didn't mention. And let me go back to the standard model to tell you about it. So as I said, the standard model is specified by the matter fields and the gauge symmetries under which they transform. And you find when you write down the most general Lagrangian that you can write down with all of those fields, that for some reason, there are extra symmetries that appear. They're only global symmetries. They don't have a force associated with them. But there is one symmetry known as a baryon number. You can rotate the quark by an arbitrary angle. Uh, and Lagrangian is invariant. And the, the normalization is so that the proton has baryon number one. So the quarks have baryon number one third as a sort of historical accident. Um, and there's another symmetry, lepton number. You can rotate just the leptons also by an arbitrary angle and the Lagrangian is invariant. Now, there is an important and surprising um, fact about quantum mechanics that we learned in, I think, the, the 1960s, that you can have a classical theory which has good symmetries. And when you quantize it, when you go to quantum mechanics or quantum field theory, inevitably, some of those symmetries are broken. And indeed, that happens here. Once we go from the classical field theory of the standard model to quantum field theory, only one combination of these two symmetries, baryon minus lepton number, when we rotate the baryon of the quarks and leptons oppositely, remains a good exact quantum mechanical symmetry. And the orthogonal combination, baryon plus lepton number, is actually broken quantum mechanically. Uh, one says there is a quantum anomaly. And so at a quantum level, it is no longer an exact symmetry. Now, if a particle physicist is perhaps not being so careful, you might hear someone say, or even a textbook say, that baryon minus lepton number protects the proton from decay in the standard model. But that's not the case. In fact, that, that uh, decay that I wrote down on the previous slide of a proton decaying into a positron manifestly respects baryon minus lepton number. The proton is baryon number one. The positron has lepton number minus one. So it respects baryon minus lepton number. And indeed, grand unified theories, even though the proton decays in them, often uh, preserve baryon minus lepton number. So to see why the proton is stable in the standard model, there's actually a subtler symmetry that we have to look at. And it has to do with, in some sense, the final part of the standard model that I haven't mentioned yet, which is this surprising fact that we were surprised to see in the discover in the 1930s. Um, that not only do we have our up, down, and electron and neutrino, but for some reason, we have additional heavier copies of those particles. And you know, the, the deep reason for why we have three generations of particles, all with the same quantum numbers, but different masses, is still sort of a mystery at this point. But masses is still sort of a mystery at this point. But it has an important effect when looking at the quantum mechanical symmetries of the standard model, which is that even though the continuous rotations of baryon plus lepton number are broken by this anomaly, there is in fact a discrete subgroup of baryon plus lepton number that remains a good quantum mechanical symmetry. It's anomaly free. Um, and it has order six, where six is two times the number of generations, three. And so that means that uh, rotations of baryon plus lepton number by two pi over six, or some multiple thereof, actually remain a good exact quantum mechanical symmetry. And this means that even though we can violate, the standard model violates baryon plus lepton number, because this discrete subgroup is good, it only violates baryon plus lepton number by six units at once. And proton decay, once we have B minus L, proton decay would require a, a violation of B plus L by two units, proton to positron cell. But we can only violate it by six units. So this is in fact why the proton is exactly stable in the standard model. It has to do with a discrete anomaly-free symmetry. Okay, now the reason I've emphasize this and spent so much time to get here is once you know the symmetry structure 
that is responsible for proton stability in the standard model, I think it's very well motivated to consider extensions to the standard model that respect this symmetry. Because empirically, it seems to be a very, very good symmetry, far better than we thought it would be. So in everything I do today, uh, I'm going to ensure that I respect this Z6 uh, B plus L global symmetry of the standard model and keep the proton stable. Okay, so this so far has all been review. This is just the standard model. Um, to address the lithium problem, I need to go beyond the standard model, but only just by a little bit. We already talked about baryon minus lepton number, which is a global symmetry in the standard model. It's not a force, but um, it's been, uh, I, I'm not the, the first one to suggest this, but um, there, there's this puzzle. Why should you have an extra symmetry that's not uh, seemingly not demanded by anything? You just write down the most general Lagrangian and you find this bonus symmetry. Why should that be? So uh, many people have discussed over the last decades that maybe baryon minus lepton number, in fact, started as a gauge symmetry, as another force, but we don't see a fifth force at energies. So just like SU2, just like the weak force, it must be broken or, or hit uh, by another scalar field to make the vector boson associated with that force, which I've called A here, um, uh, no longer appear at low energies. It gives it a mass and we don't have the fifth force at low energies. Um, good. Now, so that's what I'm going to do. I want to gauge baryon minus lepton number, and you have to break it. And as I said, you know, you can find thousands, tens of thousands of papers that do this. Um, but uh, if the Higgs field that breaks baryon minus lepton number, which we need to have, if it has charge one under baryon minus lepton number, then that means that you can have processes that violate baryon minus lepton number by an arbitrary amount, any multiple of one, uh, essentially by exchanging B minus L charge with the Higgs background. And if that happens, if the Higgs has charge one, then uh, even though we're protecting that standard model Z6 symmetry that I talked about, that would still allow the proton to decay. You could have these exotic decays where the proton uh, turned into a positron plus some number of extra neutrinos. So I, I don't want to have that. And so my point of departure from these thousands of other papers is just that I want the Higgs to have a charge greater than one, in which case you can only violate baryon minus lepton number by N. And so you keep the proton stable. Now, um, although this is seemingly a, a very small modification, it has an important effect, which is that it means there will be an unbroken discrete gauge symmetry now for the standard model fermions. And it's really a very simple thing, even though the words sound a little bit scary to particle physicists. Um, if we just take the abelian Higgs, our, our U1 gauge theory with a Higgs field, and our Higgs field has a charge greater than one, in my case, it's going to have charge six. Then when I do a gauge rotation by an angle lambda, for example, the Higgs field transforms as six lambda. It's in the you know, charge six representation. And that means that if I rotate by two pi over six, again, the Higgs field will not change. It will go to either the two pi i or just one times itself. So it's not charged under this Z6 subgroup. And when it gets a VEV, when it condenses, it will break all of the continuous baryon minus lepton number symmetry. It will give a mass to the B minus L boson. But this Z6 subgroup under which it isn't charged will remain a good symmetry. And you will legitimately have an unbroken gauge, Z6 gauge symmetry acting on the standard model fermions at low energies. Now, at this point, you might say, okay, some, some extra symmetry, but I already told you that there won't be a new force associated with it. There won't be some new light particle. And indeed, local physics is going to stay exactly the same as in the standard model. 
But just by virtue of having this extra symmetry, there is, in fact, a new class of dynamical objects in the theory, these cosmic strings that I mentioned at the beginning. And you can see this relatively easily um, just from the abelian Higgs theory. So let, let me look for solutions to the equations of motion of my theory that are independent of time and say the z direction. And far away from the origin, because the, the symmetry is broken, what that means is that the Higgs has to go to the low point of its potential, the vacuum expectation value or VEV, away from the origin. But although it must approach the VEV in magnitude, the phase is not so constrained. So you can have solutions where the Higgs field everywhere is pointing in the same, has the same phase, and that's the, the ground state. But um, you can have these non-trivial solutions. Here I've color-coded the phase of the Higgs in its potential, um, and I've tried to uh, diagram, although it, it, perhaps a bit hard to visualize, but you can have these solutions where the Higgs field, uh, the phase of the Higgs field winds non-trivially around uh, the origin. And when that happens, you know, uh, you have a solution with winding number one in sort of topological language. And by continuity, that means that somewhere in the center of space, there must be a place where the Higgs is pushed back up to the top of the potential and the symmetry is unbroken. And indeed, you find a string, basically a, a tube in the middle of space, um, in which the symmetry is unbroken. Uh, the width and the tension of this string are just given by the VEV, the only scale in the problem so far. And furthermore, since we have a gauge U1, you find from the equations of motion that there must be a non-trivial vector potential outside the string. The field strength is going to vanish, but there must be a non-trivial vector potential. And in fact, you find that there is a discrete magnetic flux flowing through the string, um, which I've written here, phi b, apologies for the uh, overusing the symbol phi. Um, and importantly, uh, th this happens whenever you have a fundamental magnetic object in some sense, but importantly, the magnetic flux flowing through the string um, is inversely proportional to the gauge coupling, to the electric charge, roughly. Good. So at this point, you might again say, okay, we have these exotic solutions, but you know, these formal field theorists or string theorists, they talk about these weird solutions all the time. They're never relevant, who cares? But in fact, because we live in a cosmology, oh, I have skipped a part, sorry. Um, before I get to that, um, he mentioned that we have Good. So we have a, a string, which is a, a tube uh, with a magnetic flux through it, roughly. And in fact, you know, a, a tube with a magnetic flux is a solenoid. And so we could really have these uh, roughly idealized solenoids existing out there in the universe. These, these string objects that are very long, but very thin and have magnetic flux flowing through them. And what I find really neat about this, um, especially for these baryon minus lepton number strings, because all of the standard model fermions have either baryon number or lepton number, is that there is a discrete version of the aronov bohm effect between all of our standard model fermions and these strings. You might have thought that the aronov bohm effect required a massless photon to sort of mediate the effect, but in fact, that's not the case. There's an aronov bohm effect whenever you have an unbroken gauge symmetry. Um, and so indeed, since we have this unbroken discrete symmetry that remains good at low energies, there is a discrete aronov bohm effect that all of the standard model fermions undergo with these cosmic strings. And because of that fact I mentioned that the flux is uh, inversely proportional to the gauge coupling, when you compute the phase that's going to be picked up 
by uh, a fermion that you transport around the string or something like that, um, you're going to multiply the electric charge by what's going to be the magnetic flux. And so the factors of the gauge coupling cancel out. And this effect does, has no dependence on uh, the, the strength of the gauge force. It can be arbitrarily small and you still have this effect. And it also doesn't depend on the scale at which the continuous symmetry was broken. And so importantly for the, the phenomenological importance of this is um, the, an enormous cross section for all of our standard model fermions scattering off the strings. Actually the effect that Aronov and Bohm first computed in their original paper was they imagined shooting an electron at um, a solenoid and they wanted to look at the cross section for elastic scattering. And indeed here, I've just generalized the result, but you find again, no suppression by uh, a small gauge coupling, no suppression by a, uh, the scale of symmetry breaking. You have essentially a unitarity limited, enormous elastic cross section for scattering of standard model fermions from these strings. It's a really, I find it a really cool uh, sort of electric magnetic uh, duality effect or interplay effect. Okay, now, yes. Ah, um, the color here was just a, uh, a, a visual tool, um, uh, sort of how you see it, well, just a, a visual tool to represent the phase of the Higgs um, and doesn't actually have anything to do with the SU3 color force. Um, you're good, uh, thank you. Yeah, so I, I should um, be very clear that all of this now is, you know, this is a baryon minus lepton number uh, electric field and a, a baryon minus lepton number magnetic flux. Um, it's unfortunate that we don't have separate names uh, for the, the general effect that I'm sort of um, uh, tied to the historical conventions here. Um, as long as the Higgs has uh, is not charged under electromagnetism. And, and indeed my Higgs is just going to have charge six under baryon minus lepton number. It's not going to be charged under any of the gauge symmetries. Then uh, these cosmic string objects, at, at least at, at first order, just involve the baryon minus lepton number fields. If that makes some sense. Yeah, but good, that, that's an important uh, clarification. Um, well, at low energies in the standard model, it's a global symmetry. Um, I'm, I'm starting by gauging B minus L. So yes, so this A is B minus L. But indeed, um, yeah, one is broken and one is not. So you don't have to worry about at low energies telling them apart uh, if that's your concern. Good, thank you. Okay, so um, here is where I get to what I, I uh, said earlier that um, you might've thought these are some exotic solutions that never matter, uh, some theorist tools to play with. But in fact, because we live in a cosmology, you necessarily create these cosmic strings in the early universe. It's not too hard to see. Um, in the early universe, these phase transitions occur dynamically. So you start at high enough temperatures with the Higgs field at the origin at the top of its potential. And when you go through the phase transition and the symmetry spontaneously breaks, the Higgs field has to choose a direction to fall down in. So that's to choose a phase. But that choice cannot be correlated over longer than a Hubble distance. The Hubble distance is the maximum length that 
signals, causal signals, can have traveled by that point in cosmology. So you necessarily get different domains where the Higgs field takes on different phases. I've tried to uh, diagram that here. Um, to, to make it slightly easier to visualize, I've, I've taken a two-dimensional slice of the universe, and I've just uh, randomly assigned different colors or different phases uh, to different domains here. And just by virtue of some random walk process, you will end up with closed non-contractible loops um, that appear. In the two, two plus one dimensional slice here, uh, these are abelian Higgs vortices, which you might've heard condensed matter theorists talking about. Um, when you think of this as a slice of the three plus one dimensional universe, then these are locations where a cosmic string passes through the board. You have, a, a, again, a, a non-contractible loop in the phase of the Higgs that cannot fully relax to a, a single value. So you find that you, um, you're guaranteed just by causality to have these strings in the early universe. And yeah, to, to, to reemphasize, what I'm really trying to do is give you some intuition for why from this relatively simple modification to the ultraviolet microphysics of the theory, you could expect some interesting phenomenon to happen cosmologically. So not only do we have, we're guaranteed to have these extra solutions, but they really will appear in the early universe. Now, um, furthermore, these cosmic strings, once they appear, have very interesting and non-trivial dynamics. And it's a really interesting story that unfortunately I don't have um, enough time to really go g give you the full uh, uh, derivation for how it happens. Um, if you're interested, I, I highly recommend, I tried to explain it in my paper, but um, I, I've tried to diagram here and again, apologies, it's necessarily a three-dimensional phenomenon. So um, it's a bit hard to draw, especially because I'm not a good artist, even in two dimensions. Um, but here on the left, I've tried to diagram cosmic strings coming in and out of the blackboard. And I've zoomed in at the point where they're going to intersect. And you can argue just by look at, looking at different slicings of this configuration, that in fact, the final state from this interaction must be that the strings exchange partners. They cut each other uh, in, in some sense. And you know, your intuition from free perturbative field theory is that generally when things collide, usually they go through each other, no, nothing happens. But in fact, that cannot happen in this case. These strings must cut, cut each other up and have this very non-trivial interaction. And importantly, this means that when a string crosses itself, it's going to chop off a closed loop of string. And these closed loops can then oscillate and emit gravitational waves and shrink, and so dissipate energy from the string network. And this is, uh, in fact, a really important phenomenological property and what makes cosmic strings, in my opinion, the most interesting sort of topological defects in cosmology, at least. Um, you you might have heard of magnetic monopoles, which are another sort of topological defects. And actually, I'll mention them again in a couple slides. And magnetic monopoles are, are fascinating for many reasons. But empirically, we know that there aren't any magnetic monopoles around now. In fact, this was one of the reasons we had to invent inflation to get rid of, to dilute the magnetic monopoles that might have existed in the early universe. And similarly, if you've heard of domain walls, which are another sort of topological defect, again, we know that they can't be around at late times. As said, cosmologists would say that they would overclose the universe. They just mean there would be too much energy density in them. So in either of those other cases, uh, you don't have uh, the, the defects, the topological defects around at late times. But cosmic strings are a very interesting sort of marginal case where they don't completely dilute away and they don't um, you know, have too many of them that, that would overclose the universe. There would be too much mass in them. In fact, 
there's a really interesting non-trivial um, so-called attractor solution, a scaling solution where um, the network of cosmic strings approaches a distribution of length of strings that depends only on the ratio of the length of string to the Hubble distance. Sorry, I should have written here, this you, you can think of as a, a Hubble patch with a radius of the Hubble distance. And what I'm trying to get at here, um, you know, of course, each individual string, they're undergoing this really interesting, complicated dynamics. They're cutting each other up, they're shrinking. But statistically, um, over time, you remain in this uh, scaling solution where the only time dependence is through the Hubble, the, the, as the Hubble distance changes in time. And furthermore, this scaling solution, sort of by logical necessity, has a negative slope. You know, since the strings are cutting each other up, they're shrinking, you have more strings at smaller lengths. And in fact, you can end up with an absolutely enormous number of relatively small strings at late times. The enhancement here, this is Newton's G times the tension of the string, or in microphysical um, uh, quantities, you can think of it's the VEV squared Planck mass squared. So depending on the scale of symmetry breaking, you can have an absolutely enormous number of strings appear at late times. So it's reasonable to expect that you could have some interesting things happen with them. So um, now, okay, so build up this picture. Uh, the, the symmetries guarantee us these cosmic strings. Cosmology guarantees us that they're going to be there in the early universe. And eventually we end up with tons of them. And the last ingredient I need to tell you about is the non-trivial interactions that they can have with the standard model fermions. And I'm going to claim that they can catalyze or amplify um, processes that destroy lithium. And you know, for some intuition as to why this isn't entirely ridiculous, we already saw that in the aronov bohm effect, you have these elastic interactions. And because they take place between an electric object and a magnetic object, and, and here again, I mean uh, B minus L electric or, or charged B minus L fermion, and uh, these cosmic strings that have B minus L magnetic flux, because of this electric magnetic interplay, in the Arnold Bohm effect, you have entirely unsuppressed elastic scattering. And so it's reasonable to ask, well, maybe you could similarly have some unsuppressed inelastic scattering that now can change energies or identities of particles. Now, um, unfortunately, there has been very little study of the case of strings um, having inelastic interaction with the standard model fermions. So in order to give you a nice conceptual picture, on the next slide, I'm going to talk about magnetic monopoles, which I already mentioned, are these other class of topological defects that have seen far more study over the last 90 or 100 years, starting with Dirac. And there we have a good conceptual picture for why you have these enormous inelastic interactions. And then I'll come back to describe what happens in the cosmic string case. Uh, un unfortunately, I don't have a great simple conceptual picture. I'm still thinking about it. But let me go to monopoles. And maybe this is a good time to uh, ask if there are any questions. OK, so there's an analogous effect that occurs with these other topological defects called magnetic monopoles, which are relatively simple things. Um, you might've seen them in your electromagnetism class. And they've been studied since Dirac originally in 1929, I think. Um, and the amazing statement is that magnetic monopoles amplify proton decay. And in fact, you can see this in the magnetic monopole case from the far infrared and really far infrared. You look at classical non-relativistic electromagnetism. And if you just write down the Lorentz force law for an electron, 
in the background of a magnetic monopole. You, you plug in the monopole magnetic field and you do some relatively trivial vector algebra, you find that the, um, the quantity, uh, 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 conserved, sorry, the conserved quantity associated with rotations is no longer the orbital angular momentum you thought, but in fact, there is an additional piece of angular momentum, which is stored in the electromagnetic field. And you could essentially write it down just by symmetries. It's the product of the electric and magnetic charges. And it points from one object to the other, from the magnetic object to the electric one. And, you know, you could, uh, this uh, Lorentz fourth law derivation is just the, the simplest low energy derivation. Of course, if you look at the real field theory or even the quantum field theory, you get the same thing. And importantly, this extra piece is entirely independent of the velocity of your electron. So even, you know, this is very surprising fact that you can have a situation where everything is at rest and yet you have non-zero angular momentum. Very interesting. And this also immediately poses a severe puzzle, which was realized in the 1930s by a bunch of people, because you can imagine shooting an electron at a monopole. And your intuition from free field theory, again, is that most of the time, the electron would forward scatter, or it would go straight through the monopole, there would be no interaction. But if that were to ever happen, then when the electron passes the monopole, this displacement vector would discontinuously flip and you would violate angular momentum conservation. So that in fact can't happen. And you argue just from the very far infrared, we can see that there has to be some non-trivial boundary conditions on the monopole that pair up fermions of different chiralities or which are spinning in different directions. And the spin flip of these fermions uh, in the boundary condition makes up for the change in electromagnetic angular momentum. Okay. Okay. So it was realized in the 1980s by Kalin and Rubikov, called the Kalin-Rubikov effect, that um, as we saw way back at the beginning, I mentioned in grand unified theories, the proton decays, it doesn't conserve this symmetry, the standard model symmetry that I'm making sure I preserve. And so monopoles from grand unified theories can provide boundary conditions that decay protons, that pair up a proton and a positron roughly. And because we could make this argument for the inelastic interaction straight from the far infrared, you again have an effect which is entirely unsuppressed by UV scales. It doesn't matter that the grand unified scale is very, very high or very short distances. The cross section for a proton to hit a monopole and turn into a positron is in fact at the strong scale, just given by the proton's mass, more or less. So again, you have a very interesting um, electric magnetic interplay that leads to enormous interactions, and this time inelastic interactions that change the identity of the particles which are scattering. Good. So this is a really interesting effect that's seen lots of study, you know, originally from uh, the 1930s and then uh, the more study on the microphysics in the 1980s uh, and since then. And there's some great work, even the last couple of years, understanding this better. Uh, let me skip the next slide because we're running a bit behind on time. But unfortunately, in the, you know, the, the case I'm really interested in is with these cosmic strings. And there have been maybe two papers on the cosmic string case compared to thousands on the monopole case. Um, so I don't have a very nice conceptual picture for you, but I can take advantage of these great calculations that were done originally by Wilczek and friends in 1989, uh, a couple of years before I was born. Uh, and in our case, as we've said all along, we're ensuring that we preserve this V6 symmetry that's going to stabilize the proton. So again, we can't have these cosmic string topological defects catalyze or amplify a, a proton decay process. But 
our Z6 symmetry uh, dictates that we can only change three baryons for three leptons at a time. And so you can derive roughly a coupling between the cosmic string and three protons and three positrons. And you can do this complicated quantum mechanical calculation that Wilczek and friends do. And you find again that you can have an enormous cross section for this process to occur. There's an interesting effect here that actually it's only for maximal, an incoming state of maximal discrete charge that the process like the kalin rubikov effect is entirely unsuppressed by the scale of symmetry breaking. Um, you know, in a U1 group, you can have an arbitrarily large charge, but in Z6, uh, three is the largest charge because if you go to four, then four is equivalent to minus two. So th the charge three has the largest magnitude of charge. And indeed, in our case, the order of our group is six and we're gonna have um, cosmologically three protons bound up in the nuclear potential well of a lithium seven nucleus that are going to be incident on the string with a charge of three. And so you have an interaction that is entirely unsuppressed. And you can have, again, a strong scale cross section for three protons to hit the string and turn into three positrons. And it can't happen for one or two protons, which is um, again, how we're going to really affect only lithium, this surprising effect. Good, so now we've seen, we have the cosmic strings, they exist in the early universe, there can be tons of them, and they can have these very large interactions that destroy three protons at once. So then it's a numerical question now as to whether the rate of such interactions can be large enough to destroy an order one fraction of the lithium and resolve this discrepancy. And the answer, as far as I can tell, is yes. Again, we have an enormous number of cosmic strings. They can have these enormous interactions. So hopefully, you know, I, I haven't given many details at all, but hopefully I've tried to build up the intuition that, again, you can have a large effect from these cosmic strings. Um, and uh, in my, my benchmark scenario, here's just a very brief plot comparing the rate of destruction of lithium to the Hubble rates. Um, and I find a, a benchmark value for the uh, symmetry breaking scale, which is morally the only free parameter in the theory that gives around 10 to the eight uh, GeV for the correct amount of destruction of lithium. But I wanna emphasize, um, you, I, I don't wanna claim that this is precise at all. It definitely is not precise. Uh, there are still lots of theoretical uncertainties on cosmic strings, especially small cosmic strings, even though those, those have been understudied by um, over about 50 years at this point. Um, and furthermore, in that previous uh, slide about the actual lithium destruction process, I definitely haven't done a precise calculation, but the important point I wanna get at here is I'm not living near any unitarity boundary or anything like that. You know, you might say, maybe I need to include some phase space suppression in my cross section, or maybe you think there are more or fewer cosmic strings than the benchmark scenario of their evolution that I've taken, and that's fine. It's just going to shift a bit the, uh, the symmetry breaking scale that you would predict to have the right rate of lithium destruction, but the, the mechanism is not you know, in imminent danger of being destroyed by a factor of two or anything like that. And let me um, give a bit of a, a broader plot sort of unfolding into two axes on the x-axis, the tension of the cosmic strings and on the y-axis, the time or when lithium uh, disintegration maximally occurs. And this blue line is that benchmark I showed you on the previous slide. Again, I'm, I've tried to read all of the hundreds or thousands of papers about cosmic strings in cosmology and all of these effects and pick a benchmark, which is reflective of the, the best literature, the best studies we have. And this, this green star is again at around 10 to the eight GeV, 
where my benchmark predicts the, um, the right rate of lithium destruction. But um, here, what's nice about unfolding into these two axes is the empirical constraints uh, really separately apply on these two axes. Um, there are universal gravitational effects of cosmic strings that we can probe with lensing or with uh, a stochastic gravitational wave background that people have been making uh, measurements or, or no measurements, getting constraints on. And indeed, those constrain very heavy cosmic strings. And very interestingly, they're already probing sort of grand unified scale cosmic strings. But the point is, as long as we don't go to too heavy tensions, um, we have lots of room to play with. And on the other axis, in terms of when this could happen, you don't really want to do anything during the CMB because we've measured it very precisely and it all looks great. And afterwards, there were, if you want, wanted to do this after the CMB, there would probably be too many cosmic strings around now. But there's tons of time between Big Bang nuclear synthesis and recombination when this could occur. And um, yeah, so, so the point again is my, my benchmark definitely isn't precise, um, but I've tried to point out this general mechanism and make estimates for how large the effects are. And there are, is lots of parameter space where this should be able to work and not mess up any of the other great cosmology known. And yeah, that's an important point. The abundance of lithium is about one part in 10 to the 10. So you might have worried that you know, even between after BBN and before recombination, you know, destroying lithium and injecting positrons into the bath could in principle do something bad, but because it's only one part in 10 to the 10, you really don't have to worry. Um, whatever, whatever happens to the final state of lithium won't really affect uh, anything we can see, at least at the level of precision we have so far. Great. So. With that, um, let me conclude uh, just with some general take home points. I think Big Bang nuclear synthesis is a really interesting and important epic in the early universe to understand. And the fact that after some decades, we still have this enormous discrepancy in the abundance of lithium that we don't understand, I think really demands some explanation. And I've tried to um, get across that surprisingly, there is a very minimal sort of model that doesn't require any complicated microphysics, but has these really interesting effects that can, in fact, pick out only lithium to be destroyed. And in fact, this model is very close, surprisingly close to the standard model. Um, there's definitely, as I've emphasized, my calculations are not precise. There is a lot more to understand about cosmic strings and their interactions with standard model fermions. I think this is a really um, open area that, that uh, uh, should have more research in it. And uh, finally, let me end on somewhat of a light point by mentioning that if you have a lead nucleus with 82 protons and it hits a cosmic string and three of the protons turn into positrons, then you are left with a gold nucleus with 79 protons. So these strings literally perform alchemy. Um, and with that, thanks very much. Um, I'll be happy to take further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. I guess we have time for questions. Here. Thanks, Pedro. Very nice talk. Uh, first, uh, on, on the Higgs that you use for the for this description, would you tell us a little bit more? I, I just saw the shape, but I don't know what is inside. How many fields? What, what, what are you using for that? Uh, Thank you. Um, since I want to break a U1 symmetry, it can actually be incredibly simple. It's just a single complex scalar field with charge six under this 
baryon minus lepton number symmetry, um, and no other is not charged under any of the other gauge symmetries. And it just has this uh, familiar wine bottle potential shape. Um, uh, and to, you know, it has to have the right sign of the mass to, to get a VEV, but that's really the only requirement. Um, that's a good question. Um, in principle, good. Yeah, there could be a richer story of maybe some quartic interactions with our Higgs, you know, the, the standard model Higgs or something like that. Um, I, I haven't looked into that in detail. Um, at least you can have this Higgs be at a very much heavier scale, in which case there wouldn't be too much interaction between the standard model Higgs and that one. But indeed, I think there really is a, a broader landscape of models here that I haven't fully explored. I think that's a really good point. Thank you. Uh, my, my other question is on your last slide in your conclusion, you, you weren't really, really heavy in the, in the nuclei, right? Uh, what, what would you say for, for lighter uh, nucleus? I mean, you, you have been mentioning lithium, but you would also wondering about another element with uh, replicas, I would say. Is any study underway or what would you say about it? A great question. Um, so yeah, an important fact of Big Bang nucleosynthesis is that lithium is really the heaviest element produced. So you don't have to worry about um, destabilizing carbon or something like that, because it simply isn't around in the early universe. But in, in terms of the late universe, uh, I agree. I think there are, are very interesting effects that could happen between these baryon minus lepton number strings and astrophysical environments, for example, stars. And I think re really that's a, a much broader point than, than this. You can forget about the lithium problem, anything like that, B minus L strings occur in lots of theories. And I think there hasn't been any study of the effects that they have when they hit stars or, or anything like that. I think that's a, another really good um, research question for the future. So, thank you. More questions? Well, thank you for your very beautiful uh, idea. But uh, it seems to hang to hang this uh, mechanism in uh, in the existence of abundant uh, cosmic strings. What are the properties of these strings? What is the flux in them? What is the size of them? How do you give an estimate of the cross section between uh, lithium? and your cosmic strings, would uh, these uh, strings have uh, some interaction with uh, gravitation? Should we see some uh, cosmic uh, signal for the cosmic strings? I have a lot of questions like that. Yeah, again, lots more great questions. Um, let's see. So the, the basic properties of the cosmic strings uh, have to do just with the U1 theory that you started with in terms of the, the magnetic flux will be dictated by the coupling in that theory. And um, the size of the cosmic string will be dictated by the symmetry breaking scale. So it, it's going to vary uh, it, it will depend on where you live in this plot, you know, for, for my benchmark points here at a tension of 10 to the 8 GeV squared, the, the size is, you know, one over 10 to the 8 GeV, very, very, very tiny, microscopic. Um, and indeed, there are these really interesting gravitational effects that people look for, um, lensing of the cosmic microwave background or of di uh, distant uh, galaxies and stochastic gravitational wave background that might be produced by these cosmic strings. And those are 
absolutely a very important probe of not just this, but any scenario in which you have cosmic strings. Um, but because it's a gravitational effect, it depends strongly on the tension of the cosmic string. And so for the moment, with the current generation of gravitational wave detectors, you can only constrain very heavy cosmic strings that way. And, um, but, but you know, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to look further down in this plot. Now, as for the cross section, um, yeah, so absolutely, again, there are, are theoretical uncertainties there. Um, this, this great calculation by Wilczek and friends shows the amplification of the cross section from the, uh, your naive guess would have been that it's just the width of the string. And in fact, it's amplified all the way up to your infrared scale, roughly the mass of your incoming state. Um, but you're absolutely right that this is, in particle physics terms, we'd say this is the, the hard or, or partonic cross section. And um, I, I don't have you know, three bare protons coming at the cosmic string. Really, they're in a lithium nucleus. Um, indeed, I, this is another point where uh, I would like to have a more precise answer. And unfortunately, um, I, as far as I'm aware, no one has really studied uh, bound states, nuclei or atoms that interact with cosmic strings. Um, yeah, and really, well, in, in some other world uh, where I did everything the way I wanted to, I would have spent another five years uh, figuring everything out by myself. Um, but in that world, I would not get another job because I wouldn't publish the paper. So um, I had to, to make some compromises um, and I, I tried in my paper to, to get out the, the basic pieces of what's going on, but absolutely. Um, I would love to do a more precise calculation of really the, the cross section for lithium and indeed extrapolating as we talked about to carbon or to whatever other at, uh, nuclei. I, th that's another important uh, extrapolation here. Thank you. Thank you, more questions. Uh, in this formalin, you can make uh, any connection with topics like dark matter. Thank you. Yeah, another great question. Um, there has been lots of work in other cases connecting cosmic strings to other puzzles. A really interesting thing to do here because I'm playing with baryon and lepton number, I think a really natural thing to look for would be to incorporate baryogenesis into this scenario. And indeed, I, I think generally with baryon lepton number strings, uh, that would be an interesting thing to study further. Um, dark matter, yeah, um, there are a variety of possibilities. Um, I talked about cosmic strings uh, oscillating and emitting gravitational waves. Um, all of them will emit gravitational waves, but in fact, you can have cosmic strings emit other particles as they shrink. They can radiate other things like standard model particles or like dark matter. And I know there have been some uh, proposals in the literature for cosmic strings that emit gra uh, dark matter in the very, well, you start with the cosmic strings and then in the very early universe, they emit dark matter as radiation. And uh, that's how you build up the population of dark matter. So indeed, uh, the, another great point, there are lots of interesting places to go in terms of other DSM physics topics that you could try to connect with it. Great question. More questions? Well, I don't see any question in Zoom. I don't see any question here, but I have just one more question. Basically, you're producing a lot of positrons right now, right here in this process in particular. And after that, you have, for example, CMB. And after that, you have star formation. And all of this will be changed by this process. And at the same, uh, at the same time, we have to see this process occur today, right? So these are three questions that you should study. Do you have any idea how to deal with that? 
absolutely great. Another great question. Thank you. Um, so what really helps out in terms of the early universe constraints is that there is so little lithium to begin with. It's about one part in 10 to the 10. So even if you turn, well, what I want to do, you turn an, an order one fraction of the lithium into positrons or some extra positrons, maybe other things as well. Um, we just don't have the precision in terms of the CMB to really, to get down to a modification of one part in 10 to the 10. Um, although, you know, maybe in, in future CMB stage four or further things, um, you'd like to, to see that prediction more precisely so you could really uh, perhaps check. Um, the other really great point in terms of what would happen today is involved in some direct detection. You'd really like to, yeah, indeed, um, although there, the cosmic string network dilutes a bit, so you have fewer, the density is smaller today, you still have lots of them around. And um, indeed, a great way to look for them would be to look for these uh, processes that change three protons into three positrons at some direct detection experiments. And probably the best one would be uh, Super Kamiokande, which is this enormous uh, Cherenkov detector in Japan that has an enormous amount of water. Um, and they do some searches for strange effects that occur in their detector. But in fact, as far as I can tell, from the searches they do, um, they would reject this signal. They, they, they don't have a search that looks for this sort of thing. Uh, so indeed, I, I'd love to talk more to experimentalists about having an analysis that looks explicitly for roughly a three proton decay at once. Um, and, and I think it would be really great to see whether such events might be in the super Kamiokande data that's you know, sitting on some hard drive in Japan and uh, they just haven't looked at it in the right way to see this sort of event. Yeah, thank you. So it has been a great talk, I guess. We have uh, great messages here and I think we are ready to stop. Thank you everybody. Thank you everybody in YouTube. Thank you everybody in Zoom. I guess, see you next time. Thank you.